In Berlin, the CIA and the KGB find themselves face to face. The war between the secret services was one dimension of a much larger conflict, a confrontation that almost boiled over just under the surface of the Cold War. Peter Volta, agent in the service of the Soviet bloc. Between 1978 and 1988, he carried out nearly 100 tense trips between West Germany, where he lived, to East Berlin to deliver information. At the time, the metro crossed through the east part of Berlin. It slowed down through the stations, which were more or less in darkness. You could only see that the entrances and exits were blocked by sandbags. And in each of these stations, the police were patrolling with Kalashnikovs. That's what you saw traveling slowly through these ghost stations. It was a very distinct image of the Cold War. For nearly 50 years, while in the service of the KGB or the CIA, thousands of agents like Peter Volta were the cogs of the biggest information war in history. It started on the 2nd of May, 1945. The German war is therefore at an end. Two worlds now face each other. Two blocks clearly defined and in the heart of East Germany one city that will become a battleground. Berlin split into two. A new war is brewing, but this one won't be fought head on. It's a new type of war, a secret war of lies and intoxication. CIA, KGB, the aim of each is to establish their influence and impose their ideology. In the ruins of Berlin, there will be all-out war. The smiles and handshakes are forgotten. The winners are still not allies. Peace treaties have been signed. Americans and Soviets, the two main winners, don't have any energy left to fight each other on the ground. So each side sets out its pawns and watches. That's how the war of information begins. Here we have one of the key places in the Cold War, Tempelhof Airport. West Berlin wasn't situated just anywhere. It was in the heart of the sector of Soviet influence. It was a thorn in the side of the Russians, a time bomb just waiting to go off. Would Berlin be swallowed up by the Soviet Empire, or would it stay a free city? That was the basis of conflict between American and Soviet intelligence services after the Second World War. Relativ schnell nach dem Zweiten Weltkrieg. In the United States, they soon realize that things may get stormy. The Soviets were a step ahead. They set up their intelligence service in 1917, 30 years ahead of America. 
a man is dispatched to Berlin to set up the first CIA cell on site. Peter Sichel steps onto the tarmac of Tempelhof Airport on the 1st of October, 1945. We had very little instructions of what to do. We had thought won the war, we wanted to enjoy life. We, we drank too much, we burned the candle on both ends. And it was only slowly that we realized that we had to wake up. They've always been good at the game. And they came into Germany with a team of people who knew the territory, knew the language, knew the circumstances, and knew security. We had to learn security. And it took us one or two years to do it. America had never been in the espionage business. The Soviets win the first battle. And it is brutal. Early in the morning of the 24th of June, 1948, the Soviet troops block the roads, railway tracks, waterways. They're hoping to cut off West Berlin with the blockade. This is the first of the KGB's plans. The information that the Soviet intelligence agency had passed on was the following. West Germany had such economic problems that it was a burden that the Americans wouldn't defend. Stalin saw an opportunity at a time when the two sides were trying to increase their zones of influence to finally get its hands on West Berlin. We could either send our tanks and force our way in, but that might cause the Third World War. We could accept it and agree to abandon Berlin, which for a time part of the American government wanted to do, or we could try to supply Berlin by air. This was my job for the next nine months, 10 months, 12 months, to find out what the Russians' plans were. And by that time, we were professional enough to be able to assess that the Russians were not preparing to go to war. We were sure of that. We assured our government of it. Peter Sichel's agents know the exact state of the Red Army and the American government follow their advice. They set off the biggest airlift in history. For nearly a year, the dance of the aeroplanes doesn't stop. 280,000 flights mean that 2 million tons of cargo reach 2 million Berliners. The city won't be abandoned to the Russians. The CIA wins its first victory. Yes, the life of Berlin has been maintained. The airlift carries on. However, the game has only just begun. Since Moscow at the start of the 50s, Stalin is leading an ideological battle against the world. In Korea, Vietnam, China, the communists are taking hold. The KGB is still there behind the scenes. Berlin is the western limit of the empire. New agents are put in charge of strengthening its position. I agreed straight away to the offer to work for the KGB. I've never regretted it. We couldn't lose the GDR because it was the last defense against the socialist system in Europe. We absolutely had to protect it. That's why we planted our bayonet there. It was our army. As long as they were based there, nothing could happen to us. Georgi Zakharovich Sanikov, a pure product of the KGB. He finished his career as a colonel. He was 29 when he arrived in Berlin. The headquarters of the KGB, which terrified everybody at the time, Karlshorst, south of Berlin.
The place was well known. It was the Saint Antoine Institute, a former monastery. A few meters from the building where the Nazi surrender was signed. The information war was going to damage the loser. It was whoever went furthest and deepest into the enemy camp who would win and manage to bring back vital information to their government. To do that, we were prepared to use all means possible. At Karlshorst, nobody suspected what would happen next. The danger would come from underground. The CIA was secretly preparing a plan that could totally change the ratio of power. It became very clear to the Americans, British and French how little they knew about the Eastern Bloc. The Soviets had much more information. It was easy to get. There were telephone directories with details of all the American units, names of their directors and their phone numbers. None of that existed on the Russian side. That was when the Americans had the idea of building a tunnel to tap the telephone lines of the Russian military. It was a way of collecting a huge amount of information. They wanted us to find out where the cables were. And we found out through our contacts in the East German Postal Service, who were in charge of all the cables. I thought it was a great idea. <laughs> The tunnel was dug, 450 meters under the Iron Curtain to the Soviet telephone lines. From there, the CIA would use 600 agents who listened to half a million phone calls. For 11 months, they thought they had a key advantage, but despite listening into Soviet conversations, they found nothing interesting. What the Americans don't know is that a man has betrayed them. His name is George Blake, one of the British Allies agents. In reality, a double agent. He works for the KGB, and his role in the tunnel makes him a legend among Soviet spies. Blake was an extremely brilliant agent. He attended a meeting of British intelligence services in London in December 1954. It was there that he learned that the Americans were planning to connect to the Russian telephone lines. This operation had a code name, Operation Gold. Blake immediately understood the importance of this plan. And a month later, all of the information and technical brief for Operation Gold found their way onto a desk in Moscow. At that time, the KGB had to make a difficult decision. Should it stop the construction of the tunnel and risk compromising its agent, or should it let the Americans go ahead in order to protect their spy? Finally, the Soviets decided not to risk their agent. They let the tunnel exist for 11 months. 11 long months where their conversations were listened into. Then, when it seemed the right moment, the KGB revealed the existence of the tunnel. Journalisten aus aller Welt besichtigten den amerikanischen Spionagetunnel in Berlin. The tunnel helps the Soviet propaganda. The KGB opens the tunnel to the press and condemns the dirty methods of the American imperialists. George Blake is finally unmasked, but he manages to escape to the east. 
he spends the rest of his life mocking his former friends in the CIA. The mission I was given was to infiltrate the Soviet headquarters. Well, I think today that I carried out my mission pretty well. In 1961, East Germany barricades itself and the duel between the KGB and the CIA materializes as a scar in the heart of the city. With the Berlin Wall, the Cold War reaches its peak. All contact is broken and it becomes vital to have men on the other side. Again, this time the KGB has a local advantage that the CIA will never have. The Stasi, the intelligence service of East Germany. From 1958, Moscow puts one of its men at its head. He goes on to become a myth, a legend. He is known as the man without a face. He is the least known and most feared spy in the West. It takes 20 years to give him a name and a face, Marcus Wolf. Was Wolf's appointment a success of the Soviet secret services? There's no hesitation needed. Yes, it was maybe the Soviet secret services' greatest success. He became a legend, thanks to the number of agents he hired. I once asked him, how many agents do you have? He replied, and I remember the phrase exactly, my agents were everywhere. Here is Marcus Wolf in 1981. In a rare document from the Stasi's archives, he addresses an audience of spies. He placed 5,000 all over Europe. In honor and respect of the great tradition of Soviet spies, we have to follow these men's example. Together, let's begin by paying our respects to the founder of the KGB, comrade Felix Edmundovich Jerzinski. With Marcus Wolf, it wasn't long before the headquarters of the Stasi at the heart of Berlin struck as much fear as the KGB in Moscow. From this office, for 30 years, the head of information led an army of collaborators. 90,000 employees and 180,000 informants, 3% of the East German population. In the basement of the building are the Stasi archives, tens of thousands of meters of shelves of files. Inside are names, places, faces, lives examined and spied upon. Nearly one in three East Germans is on file here. Under the KGB and the Stasi, spying in the East has become an impressive machine. Well, he was certainly very much an intellectual, I would say. He was uh, one of the uh, master spies of the Cold War. He certainly was very effective, especially in the later years, in terms of spying on the West, in terms of, uh, of uh, gaining secrets from the West, uh, technological uh, secrets. He had some very high-placed spies in uh, West Germany, for example, uh, Gabriele Gast at the Bundesnachrichtendienst, the West German Intelligence Service, regularly uh, supplied reports about NATO, about uh, NATO policies, military policy, about even CIA intelligence documents. 
Marcus Wolf orchestrated this huge collection of information, and at the start of the 70s, it was key. The Soviet Union and the United States are both in the arms race, and between them, they already have over 40,000 nuclear warheads. Thanks to its spies' reports, the KGB is always a step ahead. It always knows the positions of the American missiles, the state of NATO's troops, the real threat that America poses to the USSR. Peter Wolter is 24 when he starts to work for the Stasi. His role is crucial. In West Germany, he is responsible for protecting the men from the Wolf system. A distant relative headed the translation department for the West German Counterintelligence Agency. That gave me access to these offices, situated outside the bounds of the high security area. My visits were never recorded. This relative let me in, and I could see all of the documents on his desk. I could go through them, and I found some very important names that I felt were important to relay. Politicians and syndicalists who were suspected by the West's agencies, these were the names that I passed on, and I know for a fact that thanks to that, we managed to get several people out of the enemy zone. We were stronger because we had ideology on our side, which wasn't the case for our enemies. It dictated the actions of all the agents of our secret service. I can assure you that, unlike others, it was our ideals that drove our efforts. And that's probably why we worked better. We knew clearly which interests we were protecting. The battle between the CIA and the KGB was ideologic, and at that time, communist ideals were finding a voice in the youth of the West. Peter Volter is convinced that he can change the world. False papers allowed him to make hundreds of trips to the east without raising suspicions. His contact with the Stasi lives here on Stalin Allee, Stalin Avenue, Little Moscow. Here in this building was a secret apartment. It was rented to a woman, an older comrade who was over 80. I had her phone number because, of course, I couldn't directly call counter-espionage from West Germany. So I called Aunt Gertrude. I suppose she really was called Gertrude. She noted down what I had to say. For example, Aunt Emma is ill and can't come to the family party, which meant that my meeting with my Stasi comrade had to be postponed. We'd established a list of code phrases that she noted down, then she passed them to the Stasi counter-espionage over a secure phone line. Marcus Wolf's machine works at full capacity. What interests him at the start of the 70s is the deployment of American Pershing nuclear weapons aimed at the USSR. To obtain this information, he invented an incredible system of espionage. He recruited a new type of agent that he called Romeos, a romantic name for a team of psychological demolition experts who were anything but. Gabriella Klim has fled Germany, but she can't escape her memories. 7th of July 1977, she was sat on the terrace of a cafe in Bonn when a man approached her.
It really was the man of my dreams. I'd always imagined the perfect man, and suddenly, there he was in front of me. I didn't think men like that existed. My first instinct was to run away, but I stayed. We saw each other several times in 1977, and it went very quickly. He quickly told me he loved me and wanted to marry me. It went so quickly that we planned to get engaged in January 1978. Gabriella was 32. She was a translator at the United States Embassy. For her, the meeting was like in a romantic film. However, her Romeo's love wasn't quite what she thought. This love had a price to pay, and that was the confidential documents that passed through Gabriella's delicate hands. I brought him documents, but he was very skillful. I didn't even pay attention to the documents that I brought back and he kept telling me it wasn't important. And then the Romeo becomes more insistent. He vanishes, then reappears. Marriage is forgotten. Romance gives way to blackmail. Gabriella takes more risks to try and save their love. The documents that the embassy no longer needed were put into bags that were then burned. I took the documents in these bags. I tried to take what seemed useful. Then I slipped them into my handbag and I left. The embassy never checked. Then at the house I photographed them then threw them away or put them back. There were documents about weapon systems, like Pershing missiles, that I do remember. It's a technique of compromise, of compromising somebody who ultimately, when compromised, can't afford to admit that he has given information to his mistress. We tried the Romeo business ourselves, very much later on the Soviets. It never worked. We never found the right woman. We never found the right girl. <laughs> or the right Romeos. The Soviets were much more successful. For the Stasi, I wasn't a person, just an instrument. I was 32, pretty, intelligent. I had my life ahead of me. And then this outside force arrived, totally aware of his actions, and decided to end the life of this woman. Sometimes it's okay, and sometimes not at all. The Romeos had more than 80 victims, young women who provided the KGB with information from all the ministries, all the embassies. Were there no morals? Yeah, there's no morale. This, this is not a morality play. Oh, far from it. <laughs> the CIA was equally lacking in sentiments. In the middle of the 1970s, the communist system was more and more criticized. The police state had enemies inside. These were the men that the Americans recruited. After infiltrating enemy lines, they blend into the background and stay invisible. In 
Eberhard Fettkener is 71 today. In East Berlin, he worked for the CIA for four years. He was tasked with watching the movements of the Russian troops. That was the first, how do I say, my first spy training. And here's Kali. In fact, he was my liaison agent. I met Kali, who died a few years ago, on a train that was going to Prague, completely by chance. Seven years later, in 1975, it was him who recruited me to work for the American Secret Services. I didn't feel like East Germany was my home. I dreamed of living elsewhere, in the West. I also had a very romantic image of America. For me, it was the country of freedom. Es waren für mich die Helden der Freiheit. It was easy to recruit Asians. It was very difficult to recruit good Asians. Because a lot of the Germans, they wanted to show the hate of the Russians. We were not interested in that. We were interested in information. And a lot of them got caught because they, they were they wanted to be heroes. And what happened to them, to those who got killed? Some of them got executed, some of them ended in Siberia. It was a very, it was a, not a nice game. When I can so say, I started to think about this job all the time. I was always asked for more, to go to places further and further away. For example, one day they wanted me to go and observe the Soviet Army's biggest petrol depot. After a while, it became too much for me. And also my wife was implicated. She helped me to decipher the coded messages on the radio. She begged me to stop this nonsense. Of course, I became more and more scared. Today, I don't know how I managed to sleep at night, to work normally, to carry out my job as engineer, when I was living with a sword of Damocles over my head. It happened on the 28th of June, 1979. I was going down a street in my car when a brown Volga suddenly came up behind me. It overtook and then blocked my way. Three men jumped out of the vehicle and one of them asked me if I was Eberhard Fettkenhoyer. I said I was and he asked me to follow them as we had business to settle. During the trip, I told myself to take a long look at these trees because you may not be seeing them again soon. And that was what happened. Eberhard Fettkenur had fallen and the CIA had lost an agent. He was to be transferred to the most sinister detention centre in Berlin, Horn-Schönhausen, the Stasi prison. Here he was interrogated by secret service agents, quickly judged, then convicted for spying over four years on Soviet military bases. In all, Eberhard Fettkenur will spend six years in a cell like this one, a new victim of the war of the secret services.
The CIA and the KGB continue this fight by each side trying to uncover traitors. In 1974, the secret services in the West bring down a man that shakes West Germany right up to the highest ranks of the state. The man who whispered in the Chancellor's ear, one of Willy Brandt's closest advisers, was actually a Stasi agent. He started one of the biggest post-war scandals in the world of espionage. His name was Gunther Guillaume, and he moved to the West at 29. With his wife, he settled in Frankfurt and joined the Social Democratic Party. Officially living the life of a normal citizen, this exceptional spy climbed all the ranks of what became the ruling party. The Stasi agents were sent to West Germany. There, they sometimes ended up in poverty, with nothing, no money, no help. The Soviet intelligence service cut contact and wouldn't support them at all. They had to make their own way, own career, until they were successful. Several did succeed, among them Agent Guillaume. It took Gunter Guillaume 20 years to reach the Chancery, 20 years spent delivering documents on the West German political orientation. When he was uncovered on the 24th of April 1974, Chancellor Willy Brandt is forced to resign and Gunter Guillaume is arrested. It was very early in the morning. Apparently, the police and the secret services always come very early. What woke me up was the noise, a racket all through the apartment, voices. And there in the door frame, I saw my father. He was in a dressing gown and facing all these men in dark suits. This image was completely surreal. And then, in a sort of parade, my father, my mother, then my grandmother lined up in front of me so we could say goodbye. My father didn't say a word. He took me in his arms and hugged me. My mother was completely devastated. She was saying, my poor baby, don't worry. It's a mistake. Everything will be fine. My grandmother wouldn't stop crying. It only lasted a few minutes. Then my parents and my grandmother were taken away and I was left on my own in the apartment. Pierre Baum was 16 at the time. He only has a few photos left of this family that was torn apart. He never received any explanation from his relatives. To what point did my father really believe what he was doing as a spy? What did he really think of East Germany? I'm of the opinion that over the 20 years he spent in the West, he was certainly an agent, but he'd also evolved and been influenced by the West. I think that for my father, this double life wasn't just a lie to me and others. I think it destroyed him from inside. He spoke about it much later. He said that he worked for two men. On one side, he worshipped Marcus Wolf, the head of espionage in the GDR. The other man was Willy Brandt, who my father loved. I'm certain that it was difficult for my father, right until his death, to know, to analyse what he really was. This man with two faces was tried and sentenced to 13 years in prison. In 1981, Gunter Guillaume is released and returns as a hero to East Berlin. He's welcomed by the man who made him the most famous spy in the Cold War, Markus Wolf.
Gerade hier, Günther. Erstmal herzlich willkommen. Alles, alles Gute zu Hause. Gut, dass die langen Zeiten endlich zu Ende ist. So. For me, a process was started which lasted a long time and maybe still goes on today, well after the deaths of my parents. This process maybe won't have an end because I live in a permanent search to find the real identities of my parents. Who was my mother? Who was really my father? At the start of the 80s, the Guillaume affair didn't help the relationship between the CIA and the KGB. Once again, the Cold War entered a very tense period. That's when one of the less well-known episodes began. In November 1983, the Russians are convinced that the Third World War is imminent. One man plays a key role in diffusing this situation. Klaus Eichner is now 76. He was a colonel in the Stasi. His job was to go through the information gathered by agents on the ground. In 1983, NATO began large-scale military maneuvers. The tension was so high that the Soviets genuinely feared that nuclear missiles would be fired at any moment. In East Germany, pilots were in their planes, armed with nuclear missiles, with the propellers already turning. Luckily, and I admit I'm proud of it, we had a source in the headquarters of NATO. We lived in total paranoia, especially the Soviet military heads, they feared a war, and we tried to bring them back down to earth by providing the facts. In Moscow, the authorities are convinced at the last moment that NATO aren't planning to attack the USSR. The threat of nuclear conflict dissipates. There, our agent, who we called Topaz, played a decisive role. And nobody at that time knew that we were on the brink of war. Thanks to the secret services, many critical situations were diffused in Europe. In general, it's known that governments lie and cheat. To know their real intentions, you need to have an authority with independent information to mutually keep tabs on each other. The secret services contributed to peace in Europe. They allowed explosive situations to be identified enough in advance to be discreetly settled by the diplomats. In the middle of the 80s, the war between the CIA and the KGB changed considerably. To respond to Soviet power, Ronald Reagan began the Star Wars, an enormous project for a missile defence shield. The last phase of the battle was getting started. In Moscow, these photographs that piled up on the desk of the intelligence service worried those at the highest level. The Americans were striking a blow that could be fatal to the USSR. The, uh, the ability to infiltrate agents into uh, the Eastern Bloc was incredibly difficult to do. Human intelligence was not, not something that we were particularly effective at, mainly because of the ability of uh, the Soviet Union in the Eastern Bloc to protect themselves, counterintelligence. So we had to find the technical collection means. Some of this was imagery intelligence, some of this was a U-2 spy plane with satellite technology. And so the NSA decided to build uh, a state-of-the-art signals intelligence facility in the highest peak uh, in West Berlin. And of course, 
West Berlin being surrounded by East Berlin means that in every single direction you're looking at enemy territory. So it's the perfect place to put a, a intelligence gathering uh, uh, radio uh, facility. Um, and in doing so, they were able to uh, to listen even beyond just East Germany, actually into the Eastern Bloc. Um, and it was incredibly important for gathering information during that time. Teufelsberg, the Devil's Mountain, a visible sign of the advantage that the CIA was gaining on the KGB. The USSR's economy is dying. Moscow is no longer capable of financing this Cold War and following the United States. At Teufelsberg, hundreds of American agents are driving this monster of technology. 30 years later, the empty carcass of the beast remains. We're in one of the most fascinating places in the Cold War, 150 meters above sea level. Today, it's dedicated to art, but it was once devoted to the arts of espionage. From here, thousands of phone calls were listened into, as far as East Europe. It's here they were recorded, transcribed and analyzed. Everything Washington knew was based on the work carried out here. From up there, the CIA agents watching the Soviet bloc struggle and its empire crumble away. It's the beginnings of peace. The KGB and the CIA make contact. Der Austausch ist vollzogen. Zum ersten Mal konnten Kameraleute eine solche Szene festhalten. 1985, the 11th of June. It's exactly midday on the Glienicke Bridge in South Berlin. It's here that the most important exchange of spies in history will take place. From the east, a small bus just arrived. Then come uh, there was this bus ride from the prison. The pressure was so intense that I kept asking myself, what is happening? What are they going to do to me? You're not really in control of yourself in these moments. You've reached the limits of what a person can psychologically stand. On the Glienicke Bridge, a ballet of armored vehicles. The American, Richard Burt, in black sunglasses, goes out onto the bridge. He greets Wolfgang Vogel, the man who negotiated this exchange of prisoners for the Stasi. Smiles and handshakes are exchanged. Never in history have the CIA and the KGB been so close. On one side, four Soviet spies captured by the Americans are returned home. On the other, 23 agents recruited by the CIA and imprisoned by Moscow. On this bus is Eberhard Fettkenur. Klaus Plever, who looked after the relations between the two German states, got on the bus. I think there was also the American negotiator. They said to us, don't worry, nothing more is going to happen to you. And to prove it, we're getting on the bus and staying with you. When I crossed the line that marks the border, I remember it like it was yesterday. I felt something incredible. It's over. They have no more power over me. Each side took their men. The Cold War had reached its end, and in 1989, its most visible symbol would collapse. I think the fall of the war, it was the victory of the West, uh, is a big victory in the West, because it 
it proved that the system they built could not sustain, could not last. And that you could not isolate a society from the rest of the world. The intelligence services are no longer a threat. 15th of January, 1990, Berliners blockade the headquarters of the Stasi. The people reclaim their history. You think, in a way, yourself, you had played a role in that? A very small one, very small one. Just a little, <laughs> little stone in a big wall. The KGB had lost this war. In Moscow, the Soviet system doesn't last long. Later, the CIA and the KGB would find themselves engaged in battle once again, but Berlin remains the place where they fought the fiercest and closest battle in almost hand-to-hand -hand combat. <laughs> 